His latest book, which I'm sure many of you have and have heard about, is titled Unmasked Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. Andy, thank you for joining the Grace Curley Show and congratulations on the huge success of your book. Thank you so much for having me on. Andy, my first question for you seems uh, it seems like the left is in real denial that not just that they have a problem with Antifa, but even that it exists. I- I'm seeing a lot of debates, whether it's on The View or, you know, on CNN, MSNBC, whether or not Antifa actually exists. And in your book, you write a lot about the violence and the havoc that they wreak. So why do you think there is this urge from the left to downplay the fact that this is happening? Well, I think we've seen for a while now that to much of the mainstream left, the elite left uh, evidence is uh, only matters some of the time. And the evidence that I present in Unmasked, as well as my several testimonies that I've given to Congress about Antifa, is not in dispute in terms of um, a big fraction of the book is because of my citations, and I cite from uh, court documents, from police statements, all official primary sources uh, about the violence that has been carried out by these militant far-left extremists. Now, I think the bigger question is, how did this um, transformation happen in terms of this denial of reality um, by, let's say, those in the media, those who are supposed to be the the objective truth-tellers. I think it goes down to the capture of pretty much every institution by the left. And within that, the left has been now um, taken by um, critical race theory uh, ideologies. So... There's no such thing as objective fact to them. They argue evidence doesn't matter. So you can present, for example, statements from affidavits where an Antifa extremist in Portland, for example, uh, was involved in the arson attack um, during a riot and told roommates that she was excited about being involved in Antifa and was looking forward to injuring or killing police. You can present that evidence, and then it's just ignored wholesale. Right. And Andy, you were actually attacked by Antifa in 2019. And what you point out in your book is that it's just one of many attacks. And and you try to kind of go back to the beginning on how this movement started. Can you explain to my audience how it started and, you know, where, where it's at right now? So the various Antifa groups in the United States claim sort of a spiritual connection to the original capital A Antifa, which is particularly telling because the first Antifa group was the paramilitary of the German Communist Party before World War II. So they're not even hiding their own um, communist um, sympathies. And these, you know, they may call themselves anti-fascists, but these are anarchist communists who view the United States and its allies and American ideas and philosophies as um, uh, wicked and fascistic and needing to be destroyed. So, for example, when they attack buildings such as courthouses or police stations or businesses, they do it because there's a lot of symbolism and meaning behind that violence. Uh, They uh, try to burn down the federal courthouse in Portland because they don't recognize the rule of law. They view the American criminal justice system as uh, irredeemable and cannot be fixed or reformed. It needs to be burnt to the ground, which is why Antifa and BLM burn it down, burn the system down. They mean it literally. They do, for similar reasons, uh, attack police stations and try to kill police officers. And in terms of the the destruction of private property, businesses and homes, apartments, they do that because they view capitalism as a vector for fascism to spread. So it's my book. The main thing that I hope people take away from it is that they may use these labels like calling themselves anti-fascist, anti-racist, um, calling them advocates for social justice and, uh, you know, merely uh, just protesters. All of it is euphemisms to hide from the truth of what they are, which is revolutionary far-left extremists who call for and carry out violence. 
Now, I have to ask you, because I get this question from a lot of people, um, why are so few Antifa members? I've seen you in interviews talk about this, that there's very few members of Antifa, no matter how much, you know, harm they cause, that are actually arrested or, you know, are legally brought up on charges. Why do you think that is? It's because our law enforcement agencies are politicized. I mean, it's no surprise seeing at the federal level how corrupt some of these agencies were and what investigations they chose to carry out and how they carried them out. I think that applies also to the politicization and how they cover far less extremism. You know, we see the full weight of the federal government come down on those who are accused of being involved in the the riots um, on the 6th of January in the Capitol. And that's those type of investigations I support, but I support that across the board, and they're not willing to do that when it comes to those who are involved in far less extremism. Uh, we've now had in Portland more than a third of the federal riot cases of people trying to burn down federal property and storm federal property. And when I say burn down, these are people who are bringing homemade IEDs and setting off bombs in, in Portland in a major American city. And more than a third of those cases have already been dropped. Uh, the ones who have pled guilty, all they get is probation, you no know, jail time. That's not the federal level. That's supposed to be better than the local level. At the local level, we have the DA who has dropped nine, over 90% of the cases of the 1,000-plus individuals who have been arrested at the riots in Portland. So it's a breakdown of rule of law. It's a breakdown of, um, of order. It's a breakdown of how the whole system functions. So in a sick way, some of what these people are chanting on the far left is, is right. The system is not working. It's broken. Uh, I agree with them on that, but it's broken, I think, for different reasons. I'm speaking with Andy No. He's the author of Unmasked Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. Andy, I think part of the problem, too, is that we, we see from the press, they'll, they'll cover Antifa only as much as they have to, but they won't ever really get into just how violent some of these attacks are. I know that you were attacked in 2019, but you've also looked at a lot of these police reports. Can you kind of get into some of the details here about how violent these groups can get? Yeah, I think... So a lot of the violence has been concentrated in the American Pacific Northwest uh, because the political leadership there is is weak and it's all uniformly uh, less. And so uh, I'll I'll just name off a few examples off the top of my head um, just from the past couple of years. So in 2019, there was an Antifa militant who came armed with a rifle to the ICE facility in Tacoma, Washington. And uh, he came with homemade firebombs and was starting fires, and their car explode. And according to what police are saying, was trying to ignite a 500-gallon propane tank that was attached to the building. He ended up getting killed in the process. Now, that is, in my view, a terrorist attack, but it was not covered as such in the media, and a lot of people aren't even aware that that even happened. Uh, in 2020, in my home city, on the streets of downtown, an Antifa militant, uh, a so-called uh, self-style BLM security volunteer ended up following a Trump supporter in downtown and waiting for him around the corner and shooting him dead with the pistol before fleeing out of state and ending up getting killed by federal authorities. Um, in Chaz, in Seattle, in nearby downtown for more than three weeks, Antifa and BLM were able to take over six blocks of city property created a hard border and said, and essentially, in my view, declared an act of war in that they said that they were a sovereign territory who did not recognize American jurisprudence. And that led to six shootings, attempted raids, arson attacks, mass destruction and violence, and two homicides. Now, now, Andy, I want to switch gears here really, really quick, um, because we only have so much time left. I saw an interview with you recently, and you were discussing your opinions on the left's coverage of anti-Asian American hate crimes. And you kind of said that you don't usually talk about this, but you are Asian American, and you said you find the narrative that's being pushed right now to be offensive. Can you kind of explain where you're coming from with that? So, um, 
hate crimes against Asian Americans have been going on for a long time, but the media, the mainstream legacy media, is not paying attention to it until they feel like they can blame it either on Trump or right, white supremacy. And both of these are misdiagnoses. So I feel it's important for me to speak up, even if these are not the normal reporting beats that I cover. You can look at the data from uh, the DOJ on the um, the race of perpetrators and victims and interracial violent crimes affecting Asian Americans. And overwhelmingly, it's being caused by black Americans. And that may be a sobering, un- uncomfortable fact to discuss, but I think it, we need to talk about the data and the information that we have, the empirical evidence openly, so that we can address it. Now, if we're blaming it on things like um, white supremacy or Trump, then you're placing the blame elsewhere, in, in my view, for a very cynical political game. And, I mean, it's people's lives and well-being who are on the line. Uh, I felt very sick that the way um, politicians and journalists and commentators chose to immediately assume that the shootings in Atlanta were because of anti-Asian sentiment when local investigators as well, that FBI came out pretty quickly to say there's absolutely no evidence for that. And they try to play that same race baiting game with the shooting that happened in Boulder, Colorado this week. And that blew up in their face when the suspect ended up not being a white man, but rather a Muslim Syrian immigrant. Yeah, and Andy, before I let you go here, this is Andy No. You guys can follow him on Twitter at Mr. Andy No. It's N G O. And make sure you check out his book. It's fabulous. It's Unmasked Inside Antifa's Radical Plan to Destroy Democracy. Andy, without getting into specifics, um, out of respect for, you know, certain people that I, I don't want to name anybody, but the reception of your book from some people on the left, it's been really controversial and even people who voice that they like it or they learn something for it they seem to be getting punished for just expressing a different opinion are you surprised that this book has managed to infuriate the far left like it has um i'm not surprised because even before the book came out there were efforts in the pacific northwest um to get the book banned from some of the big bookstores and they did have some minor success with that um, the hatred that's been directed at me, I'm used to that. I've been dealing with that for a few years now because of the reporting that I do. But it, it does pain me a lot to see people who dare to read my book and have something maybe nice to say about it, that they are made to suffer. So um, it's not, you know, this is just, I mean, people might want to call this cancel culture. I don't think that's the right term. We're really dealing with a, it's like a cultural revolution and this sort of witch hunting culture that people are trying to normalize. And uh, that's that's a quick way to break down society and move us into tribal warfare, in my view. Andy, no, thank you so much for joining the show. We hope to have you on again soon. Thank you. All right, guys, and we'll have that available for podcasts if you want to share it with your friends. If you've ever wondered what makes Omaha Steaks so damn good, it's the aging process. Omaha Steaks ages their steaks at least 21 days because that's the sweet spot. It's where the magic happens. You can try those mouthwatering steaks in the Butcher's Best Sellers Grill Pack. It includes four of their iconic and fork-tender Butcher's Cut Filet Mignons, four ultra-juicy burgers, For savory pork chops. See, pork chops, Jared, I don't know if you know this, underrated. Very underrated. People don't pay enough attention to pork chops, but Omaha Steaks, they know what's up. So you get the four uh, savory pork chops, desserts, and so much more. Go to omahasteaks.com, enter Curly with an E, -E C-U-R-L-E-Y, into the search bar for a special price on the Butcher's Best Sellers package. Plus, you'll get four more chicken breasts and four more of those delicious burgers for free don't be orlando bloom don't only have one steak a month no get the (laughs) omaha steaks and eat steak and pork chops all the time you know what 
that I'm I'm proud of this show. If, if that's if that's the one thing you take away from this show, then I'm okay with that. I would look at an Omaha steak and say, you know what? That is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. Indeed, Omaha Steaks has been the leader of gourmet steaks and food since 1917. No one comes close to matching the flavor, tenderness, and value of Omaha Steaks. So here's the deal. You want to go to omahasteaks.com, type keyword curly, C-U-R-L-E-Y, into the search bar and order the Butcher's Best Seller Pack today. Don't forget, you'll get four free chicken breasts and four burgers. That's omahasteaks.com, keyword curly. We'll be back on the other side with your calls. This is The Grace Curly Show. Curly Show will be right back. 